Today's episode of Sports Spectrum with Nate Solder, the New York Giants offensive lineman, is presented by Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. Check out fillthestadium.com to learn how you can donate and help release a child and their family from poverty. COVID-19 has done some major damage to these kids and their families on the other side of the world, and Compassion is doing something about it, partnering with our pro-athlete friends to help fill the stadium of 70,000 children and their family who need urgent support through the Compassion programs. Check out fillthestadium.com to learn more and donate today. Fillthestadium.com. This is Sports Spectrum, the intersection of sports and faith, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I am Jason Romano. We're so glad you're tuned into our Sports Spectrum podcast. Today, we got a great conversation with Nate Solder from the New York Giants coming up in just a second. First, want to direct you to our website, sportspectrum.com. That's the home base. That's the place you want to go to every day if you're looking for stories on the intersection of sports and faith in Jesus Christ. That's our ministry website, sportspectrum.com. When you get there, You'll find all sorts of free content, including devotionals, podcasts, articles, different stories each day posted on the intersection of sports and faith in Jesus Christ right there at sportspectrum.com. And when you're at the website, do us a quick favor. At the top of the website, you'll see an icon that says newsletter. Click on that icon, sign up, put your email address in, and you'll be good to go to receive our free weekly newsletter that comes to your email inbox every single Wednesday, kind of updating you on all that you may have missed here at Sports Spectrum. And we have a free gift for you right now. If you sign up for our newsletter, by just putting your email address in, you will receive a 10-day daily devotional written by professional athletes. 10 days, pro athletes writing these devotionals to encourage you in your faith. It's a PDF, a downloadable PDF that comes to your email that you get for free, and you can read it on your device, on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. You could even share it with a friend, maybe go through it together for 10 days to help you grow in your faith in God. And it's free right now when you sign up for our newsletter at sportsspectrum.com. Nate Solder is our guest today. He returns to Sports Spectrum, the New York Giants offensive lineman, We got a lot to catch up on with Nate because in 2020, because of COVID-19, he opted out of the Giants season last year. And we talk about that decision that he made, but now he's back. It's 2021 and he signed a new deal and he is back with the New York Giants. And Nate's learned a lot in this past year, especially regarding his faith and trust in God. He's also wrestling through a lot of things right now too, which is really awesome to hear Nate kind of be vulnerable and authentic and what he's battling right now and kind of going through. So take a listen to Nate Solder, our conversation. It's a powerful one. And Nate is such a, he's sold out for Christ. That's what I love. He's such a great guy, but he loves Jesus. And I think that's going to come through when you hear Nate Solder joining us right now on Sports Spectrum. Take a listen. Nate, welcome back to Sports Spectrum, buddy. How are you? Good. Well, great. Uh, nice to be here. It's good to talk to you. I think this is the first time on the podcast that you and I have talked just one-on-one. We had you on with with your wife, and right. we told yeah. that story when you just got back from Uganda a couple years ago, and then we've had you on some of our Spectrum uh, football specials, yeah. but this is the first time we've done kind of a one-on-one on the podcast, so I'm looking forward to it, uh, yeah. and the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that you're back. You're yep. back. You're, you're a football <laughs> player. Last year, you took the year off and you're back now. So how has the offseason been going as you're getting ready for 2021 and this year? How's it been going now that you've opted back in with the Giants? It's been good. Um, I did anticipate that my body and my mind were going to be out of it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that has been true. But uh, I got a chance. I went down to Florida. I got down there, um, got some good training in, got my body kind of prepped. So then when we came back together as a team with the Giants and the facility, the speed ramped up and everyone's kind of expecting my body was ready to go. (laughs) My mind wasn't quite ready to go. I kind of came in there as like the, uh, 
the senior in high school was like, Hey, I don't kind of care about this. I got this new perspective and I'm going to enlighten you guys all. And I think that <laughs> came in a little hot. <laughs> so so I, made, I made some jokes that I thought were funny, but people didn't think were funny. So I had to take a step back and my wife reminded me, maybe it's a chance to be humble and just kind of work your way into your role and what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So, but it, it was embraced great, you know, and I have a great relationship with Joe Judge. Um, I've got to sit down with him and, and I think very highly of him and what he's doing there. So I'm excited about it. Well, and it's gotta be interesting coming back when there's new players, there's new teammates Obviously, the system is not much different, I would imagine, but it's still coming back to it's kind of like taking your junior year off of high school, right? You come back after your sophomore year. I'm just thinking, like, if I took a year off from high school and in sophomore year, you think you're doing okay, everything's good, and you come back and it's senior year, but you're like, oh, there's different people here now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's still the same school. That must be kind of how it felt for you. Yeah, big time. Um, and the football's the football, right? So I didn't spend a lot of time studying my playbook in the off in the year that I took off. Um, so once the football kind of came back, it was kind of like riding a bicycle. Hey, hey, you know, we run outside, we run inside, we run gaps, we run this, you know, so that wasn't such a big hurdle, but um, it was really neat meeting the new players on the team. And it mm. was a real gift too, because we're sitting in the cafeteria one day, we're having a conversation. I think it was about marriage. And uh, one of the guys says, well, you know, in my, he was from Ghana. He says in Ghana, we do it this way. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is a whole different group of people. I'm just so excited to get to know each one of these guys. Um, and that was really a neat experience. And then recently I had a couple guys that came up to me and said, Hey, we'd really love to come to church. I said, I've been, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been shoveling, digging, trying to build these trenches to get people to come to church, get people to love Christ. And these guys are coming to me. <laughs> so it's wow. just confirmation, you know, that Christ was in it and everything. And they came to church with us and they enjoyed it. I said, Hey, why don't you guys come over to our house? So about six guys spent the whole afternoon sitting in my backyard with the kids running around and we just ordered food and just sat around and talked. And I was like, this is just a nice breath of fresh air to have some relationship with some mature, thoughtful guys that love the Lord. You know what I mean? It was just so such a blessing. And they were all new guys that hadn't been there when I was there the previous time. So wow, it was really cool. Yeah, that is awesome. And I'm thinking too, you know, on two levels, we all missed that community because of COVID. We all had to kind of shut down for a while, but for you, you were away and to come back, I, I would have to imagine there's such a unique bond with your teammates and the community that's inside an NFL locker room, man, that must've been refreshing to be able to come back and have that again. And especially with new, new teammates. Well, that's right. And um, I'm trying to think of what our record was, but I think we won four games. So we ended that season with this, just this, this weight of depression and everyone's just feeling so low about themselves to walk into a building with, with a totally different feel, a totally different group of people with different experiences. Um, and like you said, I think that that was part of it. Everyone was just excited to be in that relational, you know, atmosphere because we've all been in the pandemic, but it was also when you're around your teammates and they're kind of fighting for what you're fighting for, like, Hey, I can give a little bit more to this. I can kind of buy into what you guys are all about. So that yeah. was pretty cool. And there's expectations. I mean, you played on a team that had expectations every year with the Patriots, and now there's pretty good expectations with the Giants. There's a lot of people who've been talking them up, and they had a good season last year, finished strong at the end, almost made it to the playoffs. And so this year, um, there's expectations, but that's yeah. probably something you're used to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I, I thought a lot about that at the Patriots, but only because – you were expected to win the Super Bowl, you know, what I mean? <laughs> that's the <laughs> highest expectation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really was what anything less than that was kind of a failure of a season. Yeah. Um, but I actually think Joe summarized it really well. And I was kind of fired up. I wanted to stand up and shout, but <laughs> he said, guys, they're going to ask you about expectations, the media, they're going to say, Hey, what do you think about expectations? He says, this is what you need to say. And this is what you need to think. He says, you got to do your job. You got to work hard and you got to be attentive. He says, I don't want you to worry about wins, losses and performance. He says, just do your job, be attentive. And, uh, and uh and everything works out you know what i mean so it's like do the things that you kind of control um and let the, the let the things let the cards lie where the cards are going to lie because we can't control all of those things so I, yeah. I just love that i just love that because we get so anxious and scared about what we can't control you know what i mean um yeah. and so from our leader i was all about that i like that a lot <laughs> oh yeah well it's interesting too because it's it's a longer season now right i mean it's a shorter preseason but 17 games versus 16 games yeah. it has to be about the you know the this process of looking at it like a marathon because if you try to sprint through an nfl season even even though it goes fast yeah. it, it's 17 games now 
And that's got to yeah. be, you know, you're coming back from taking a year off and now it's 17 versus 16. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Right. That's right. I, that's true. Um, there's some resiliency involved with that. And uh, I think I said it into um, there was a small breakfast group that um, Mr. Kraft had had me spoke to. And I said, every year, you don't know what it's going to be, but there's going to be some adversity. <laughs> Weeks later, I got testicular cancer. Um, that, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was the, the next season that my son got sick. You know, all these sort of things is like every year there's some serious adversity, and, you know, and you think of it as just wins or losses, but there's, there's personal crises that are going on every team every year. So a lot of things happen throughout a, a, a season and to put it together and actually win a championship, you've gone through a lot of things as a group. So it's really nice to have that sort of community and, and people you can rely on. We have Nate Solder here with us here on Sports Spectrum. Go back to the spring uh, and summer of 2020. And I remember kind of watching you contemplate this decision, uh, what I have to imagine was not an easy one, but that decision to say, I'm not going to play. And, you know, there was, you weren't the only one, clearly. So it wasn't just one guy. It was a lot of guys that actually opted out. Um, talk us through that and what that was like, uh, especially how your faith played a role in that decision. And I know certainly some other things as well that you may have already just mentioned that played into that role, but making that decision had, had to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question. Um, I think there were some sincere, um, good reasons that I wanted to play. I think that I felt that I was letting my teammates down. I think that, um, the fact that, uh, it was going to hurt my career. I think those are both sincere, uh, genuine reasons, yeah. but I also think that there were some more sinister reasons. I think that I was addicted to performance. I was addicted to my identity wrapped up in, in who I was as a football player. Um, and, uh, I think taking a step away and realizing that the world does not depend on me, <laughs> the Giants will carry on, the NFL will carry on, lives will not be impacted dramatically by my, <laughs> by my, you know, willingness to play or not play. Yeah. And so, um, and it was great time too, that I could really refocus on what the priorities are. And uh, I think those get all out of whack when you're starting to put your career and all those sort of things in front of your family. <laughs> and that's what I was doing. That's what I've been doing. And at 33 years old now, I feel like it's the first time where my life's not all about me, which mm -hmm. has actually been a bit of a relief this year. <laughs> That's good. It's It's got to be, I have to imagine, really difficult when you're sitting there on a Sunday afternoon in the fall watching football, probably for the first time since you were a kid. I mean, at least since you came into the NFL, right? That you're watching games on Sunday and not playing. What was yeah. that like, that experience like? Because I, I remember having you on in January on our football special, and you said, I actually kind of enjoyed it at yeah. some points because I was getting into it as a football that's fan, right. but that still that's had right. to be weird watching versus playing. Um, no, I, I enjoyed watching the games. I think the weird thing was I no longer was viewed as an active football player. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of attention that you get used to that was absent. And so I, you know, I had this little mantra, it's like, Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of God and God loves me no matter what my performance is, no matter what I'm doing, you know, it's not based on that. So I kind of had to tell myself that over and over again, because I could quickly, you know, fall into that. Hey, I'm irrelevant. No one knows who I really am. And, and I want to show right. shot one, two Super Bowls. You should know who I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I wanted to put my identity in, you know, my accomplishments rather than, you know, what it really should be in. When you think about last year, what was the Lord impressing on your heart too? Because a lot of it had to do with spending time with family and yeah. being around um, your kids and, you know, a third one that arrived too yeah. at, at some point over the past year. I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, so your family was growing too. Talk about that and your faith and how that played a role and what yeah. you learned over the past year or so when you made that decision. Yeah, there's there's been a lot that I've learned. Um and, and uh, I, I took my master's, I began my master's degree because I wanted to know more about the Bible. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I mean, I know more about the Old Testament, we can go into the richness and the depth of so many different books in it. And it's just been fantastic. But you really have to pause and take time to let it soak in, you know, where it's not just head knowledge, and you could talk about it theoretically, or anything like that, but where it applies to your heart and what you really feel about the things. And so one of the things I realized, and this was after hours of deep diving with counselors and my own personal story with, with my relationship with my dad. And, and I hadn't had some resentment towards God that I hadn't worked through yet. <laughs> um, it stemmed itself into pride. It stemmed itself into, 
not really trust him. Um, my dad can have a, a volatile sense of um, anger. And so I often felt like that's how God was towards me. It was just a matter of time before he was going to get angry, punish me, because that's how he is, because that's how I viewed God, because how my dad was. <clears throat> so it was really, really nice. It dissolved a lot of those things when I could sit down, articulate those things, let the flood of emotions feel, sit through those emotions, work through that sort of thing, um, communicate it back to my dad. And we reached another level of relationship that I never thought we would come to, um, which has been really fantastic. And it's been an outpost, I think, um, for all these years of, of um, Satan's work on my heart. You know, he helped me buy into a different identity than was my true identity. He was, he was, feeding me lies that I was, that I was accepting, you know, that I had to be based on my performance, that I needed it to cover up with another code of, you know, get stronger, get more muscular, know more about the Bible, even, you know, even good things um, yeah. weren't the true thing about who I really am. So, you know, that was a long process and I, and I still have a long ways to go, but I do want to share that with a lot of guys because I know there's a lot of people in that position, you know? <clears throat> Absolutely. I was talking to somebody recently too, about, the view of God as father. And the only example for many of us is our own father and not all of us. And I'm raising my hand here as well, had a great example. And I don't know the full background relationship with you and your dad, but I know for me, and a lot of people have heard me say this on this show, my relationship with my dad was strained for many years. So when I came to this relationship with Christ, I think the actual faith in Christ part, I don't want to say it was easier, but I could understand that I needed a savior because I was a sinner. But seeing God as father was hard for me because I didn't have a real great father growing up. And I, I, all I had was what kind of what you described in a lot of ways. It was not the picture of who God is as father. Um, can you kind of go into that a little bit more about just yeah. seeing God as father and, and yeah. maybe what your view of God as father was, yeah. you know, early on growing up into yeah. where you are now? Yeah, well, in uh, reading your book that resonated with me, you were talking about how you dove into sports as a way to, to, to kind of hide away from that. It was my escape. Of, yeah, yeah, there was escape from that. Right. Um, and I think what I what the way that I did it was through performance, because that was the time where my dad was actually proud of me. That's when my, he, he would come to football practices and it'd be like, hey, look at this. This is my son. Look how wonderful yeah. he was really saying, look how wonderful I am. Um, based on my performance and and that kind of made me feel like we had a relationship but mm -hmm. what it was really lacking was any real depth and um i carried a lot of shame and a lot of guilt for what he did to me you know mm -hmm. um and uh owning up to that because <clears throat> when you carry that guilt around it's almost like uh you have a big secret that you're hiding and, and you're not worthy of being loved you know yeah. and um when, when, when God knows those things and I can finally articulate them to him and share them with him. And he could, he could still, you could still have the presence of God, even in those things. It gave me a wholeness of, of relationship with my father that I didn't ever have before. And it also makes me appreciate, we talked about thankfulness before. It makes me appreciate yes. um, the good times that I did have with my dad. Cause there were a lot of those too. And it's not just the few moments of severe trauma that will um, be the identity uh, and the characteristic of how I identify with my dad. Is your dad still with us? Yeah, he is. Okay. I wasn't sure in the way you he were is. referring. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I, 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 I uh, struggle because I want to, I, I don't feel real comfortable going into details of our relationship. Of course. Um, but we have had a lot of reconciliation, both my dad and I, and come to find out he held a, held a lot of the same guilt and shame that I did about the mm. same exact things. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, it was the first time it, it felt like peers as man to man, we could talk about these things. Now that I have kids of my own, it's like, dad, you realize I understand this struggle. I get mad at my kids too. You know, I know what it feels like, Yeah, you know? And, and um, so that, that's, that's a blessing. That's a gift. It almost feels like it was just yesterday where all those things happened. And now we have a chance to reconcile. It's, it's really cool how you can see God knows the whole story from front to back. Let's take a quick break from our conversation here on Sports Spectrum to tell you a little bit more about our friends at Compassion International and our Fill the Stadium initiative. COVID-19 last year wreaked havoc on the world. It also wreaked havoc on Compassion. See 70,000 kids 
and their families in compassion programs were going to be stuck without a sponsorship once everything shut down. 70,000 is also the capacity of the average pro football stadium. Thus, our football friends and other people in the world of sports teaming up with compassion to stand in the gap and make sure that these kids do not go without the urgent support that they need. Things like essential food, nutritional supplements, hygiene essentials, medical screenings for COVID-19, and much more. We need your help. Check out fillthestadium.com to learn more and to donate. And here's an update right now. As we speak, 70,000 kids in desperate need of help. We've actually filled 56,000 seats. How amazing is that? You guys are awesome. 56,000 kids and their families being restored what COVID-19 had potentially destroyed. But here's the thing. There's still 14,000 seats left. That's our goal. We're going to hit it. 70,000 kids with Compassion's program. We're almost there, so we need your help. Providing essential food, medical care, and support for a child and their family during this pandemic. You can donate right now at fillthestadium.com. This is a stadium that cannot remain empty, and your dollars are actually working. Places like Peru, Honduras, Ecuador, Uganda, the Philippines. This is making an impact. Let's continue to make this impact and get to 70,000 kids. Fillthestadium.com to donate today. A stadium that cannot remain empty. Fillthestadium.com. We're so glad to have Nate Solder from the New York Giants here on Sports Spectrum. You mentioned your children earlier. I did want to ask you specifically about Hudson, who has fought a very public battle with cancer, um, one that you and your wife Lexi decided to make public. Uh, but I'm just curious how he's doing. I'd love to hear an update and hear how how Hudson's doing. Yeah, no, it's been public. Um, first off, he's doing great. He's doing wonderful. His hair's grown back. He's so strong. Good. But it became public when me and Lexi sat down and we were going to this cancer event. We're like, you know, there's no reason for this to be held on by ourselves. This is going to be helpful to somebody else too. So we need to share this. Hmm. Um, it's, it's been an interesting dynamic uh, <laughs> to, to have a public, you know, struggle like that. But it's, it's been really good because I think that it's resonated with so many people that are going through struggles, you know. And so we've been able to help and, and comfort a lot of others too through it. But, but yeah, so my daughter just had her honoring for her preschool today. And she was, um, the word that they gave her today was the encourager. <laughs> which That's good. I couldn't have been more blessed. I mean, she was so... <laughs> And they shared a story. She said, you know, you looked over at your friend's painting and you said, wow, that sure is beautiful. I'm like, you know, from a, for a preschooler, I was like, what a little angel, man. What, that was amazing. So I was so proud of her for that. So yeah. Is that, is that, is that because of you or because of Lexi? We, 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 we give Lexi all the credit there, right? <laughs> Lexi gets all the credit. <laughs> Lexi, you know, Lexi and uh, Charlie, my daughter, they get the credit. So she, you know, she has a great heart. So that's good for her. That's good. Well, we're happy to hear about Hudson too. Nate Solder is joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Um, I don't think we've ever had you share this before um, in the times we've had you on the show, but I don't think I've ever heard your testimony of when you came to faith in Christ. And it may have been a gradual process, and mm -hmm. maybe you've alluded to it in different places, but I don't think I've ever asked you that question because of the different conversations we've had. Um, can you share that? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, um, I was mostly opposed to faith and um, very cynical, very critical of anyone that, that would describe themselves as Christians. I grew up in a mostly Christian uh, town, and um, I was pretty opposed to any of that sort of thing. I thought it was foolishness. I didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. But I probably did reap the benefits. I mean, I had a wonderful school environment. I had a lot of friends that were very giving, caring, generous, loving people. Um, but as soon as I got to college, I just, it was kind of my battle axe. I was just going to find every Christian and just kind of chop them down mm. a little bit like Paul, probably not as good as Paul, you know, <laughs> <at it. laughs> yeah. but, um, a, a little bit like that. And, uh, I, uh, ended up running into a couple of friends, um, that just kind of beat me down, you know, and, and in the most loving way possible, they revealed to me that I don't have all the answers, you know, and it was such a blessing. Thank God for people like that, where, you, you, you stop and you pause and you say, maybe I'm not right on this, you know, and, and mm -hmm. one of those, one of those friends um, met me during the lockout. I was living with a friend on his basement and we're training and everything. And he gave me a book by Tim Keller called the reason for God. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I sat and read that book over and over and over and I, I, I couldn't work through it. I'm like, these answers sure do make a lot of sense. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. And for me, it was very logical. I think this last year was where I actually got emotional about things, but it was a logical holdout that I had about uh, Christ. And, and I think that stemmed from my relationship with my dad, the dynamic in my own, uh, my own household, where it was very much that way too. It's like, Hey, this God thing's kind of foolishness. Um, but something broke inside of me and, and it's just an indication that God was working on me. And, and I went to PAO and I, I just felt convicted one day. I was like, I think I'm going to get baptized. I think this is going to change my life and I'm ready to share it with the world. I did. I got baptized and, um, it was not life-changing at that moment. Yeah. I look back on my baptism and say, thank goodness that that happened. It's a profound moment in my life, but I was still kind of dabbling. I was half in, half out. Didn't really understand what it meant. And um, Jack Easterby at the Patriots sat down with me, put his arm around me. We had lunch one day. And I said, I, you know, I just have a problem with Christians because, you know, I was, I was equating a Christian to a Republican in the political spectrum. And he said, you know, the only, the only uh, politician I, that I believe in, he was only served three years and then he was assassinated. And, it, you know, it was, like, it was a little bit humorous. And I was like, I like that, though. You know, it's like, let's, let's follow Jesus. Let's stop following all these, these um, fallen versions of he, him. You know what I mean? Let's follow the one that's the true God, you know. So um, me and Jack have a tremendous relationship. He poured into me so much. Um, I'm going to the same seminary that he was taught up in. You know, it's, it's just, I feel like his disciple, I'm a Jack used to be disciple. And, and, yeah. uh, and uh, that's kind of my testimony, but it's impacted everything. So we can talk about every one of those factors. <laughs> Absolutely. No, what happened going forward though? So when you start to get that right, when, so there's one thing to be baptized, one thing to say sort of, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Right. But then it's after that and you go back into the locker room, back onto the field, back to being um, Nate Solder, but you're a different Nate Solder, but maybe not a different Nate Solder, as you said, kind of one foot in, <laughs> one foot out. But what changes yeah. in, in, in terms of how you approached your job and the yeah. high, very high profile position that you're playing, you know, yeah. protecting Tom Brady, playing on the biggest stages and certainly in winning Super Bowls. What changes when you start to think about how your faith was growing and how you were changing yeah. as a person? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's these there's these secret things that Christians do that they're so secretive and they hide and they go behind closed doors and they're called Bible studies. And I was like, this is the weirdest <laughs> thing in the world. You guys are hiding in this corner doing this Bible study. Yeah. And, you, you know, you always see the door open and it closes quickly. And I'm like, what are they doing? You know, I'm like looking through, what are they doing in there? And so I, I, I asked that same buddy that gave me that book. I said, it's kind of, you know... <laughs> it's not going to be very cool for me to walk in that Bible study. It's going to be a little bit humiliating for me to actually admit that I'm interested in what they're doing. Hmm. Um, and first of all, for the people outside the room, because they're going to say, Nate's going in there. What is he doing? And then once I get in that room, it's going to reveal immediately that I have no idea what is inside of that book. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I remember reading the first couple passages and, and they have the little subscript of, of the number of the passage. And I was reading the number two, because I'd never read a Bible before. I didn't know what that even meant. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. Um, and so I'm in these, in these rooms and the Jack said to me, he says, Nate, I don't want you to get caught up with what, you know, what, what you don't know, just, you know, don't think too much about that because you don't know where anyone is in this room. Um, I think that's a real fear for a lot of non-Christians. Hey, you know, they know all the worship songs or, or Hey, they know that whatever the hail Mary, I don't know what it is, but it's intimidating. Uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, I just continued to pursue and, and pretty soon about two years later, I was the one inviting people to the Bible studies and I felt like I'd, I'd, um, I was the Benedict Arnold. I was like coming over <laughs> enemy lines. You know I, mean? I, was, mm -hmm. I was, you know, and, um, so the last Super Bowl we played Philadelphia, we had a Bible or, or chapel study, like a lot of teams do the night before. And we were all standing around in a big circle, just talking about what we were thankful for. And each man went around and we were just sharing how thankful we were for each other. And it was so powerful how, one guy said, you know, your example as a father, you know, the other guy, your example as a man chasing after Christ. And we just had such a profound movement. The Super Bowl, the biggest event in our careers was the next day. And none of us were overwhelmed by that. We were overwhelmed by the fact that we had each other as brothers in Christ, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and that was the revelation to me is we're just kind of playing football. This is just what we do. You know, there's such a bigger narrative going on right now that we just 
the devil's deceiving us of, you know, he wants you not to be aware of that. So that was where it really came to fruition to me. I ended up being a free agent the next year. And I said, I'm going to do whatever God tells me to do. We've ended up in New York of all places. You know, I'm from a small town in Colorado and God's called me to New York, which his plan is still in, unfolding in front of us as we are here today. Yeah, no, that's really great. I, I, I find it fascinating too, that, you know, you are a two-time Super Bowl champ, but that Philadelphia game, whenever, if any Eagles fans are listening, they're smiling. And obviously it wasn't the outcome that you hope for on the field, but does that perspective help you in, in, the, in the way to cope with a loss like that? Because there's a lot of players who, you know, never win a Super Bowl, but and, and then they have a hard time moving past a loss. Like it, it, it haunts them. It consumes them because, like you said, it's based on performance and the outside world is watching and is, you know, judging you and, and saying, oh, good performance or that ah, was a really bad performance. But did that perspective, even thinking about the night before, which is such a great story, help you kind of process wins and losses differently? Yeah. Yeah. It was still difficult to go through that loss because you felt like you didn't play up to your potential. And there were so many things you left on the table. You could have done better. Of course. But I looked over at that other sideline and they were so rock solid, steadfast. You know, they had a couple of trick plays that were so powerful. But the guy that stuck out to me the most was Nick, you know, Nick Foles. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, he just looked fearless from our sideline, looking to his sideline. He looked like he was in the backyard playing with his, you know, brothers or something. It was like phenomenal to watch. And you'd seen, I'd seen numbers of quarterbacks just melt down playing against the Patriots in a high pressure situation. They yeah. couldn't handle it. They fell apart, start throwing picks, all this sort of things. That's how we won a lot of games. He did not melt down. He rose to the occasion and it was something divine and powerful about watching him. And I felt very strongly about that. Nick and me have become great friends. And it was interesting because he went to Jacksonville. I go to New York. I'm the highest paid offensive lineman in the history of the league, whatever. Yeah. Yes, that is, you know, and he's, he's in a similar situation down there and our careers end up very similar situations. You know, I'm, I'm the, I'm third string tackle now and he's, you know, as a backup. Um, and there was a lot of emotions that went with that, but um, to have brothers that are going through similar situations man, we love each other. And it's so cool that we can be together with that whole, whole process. So. Yeah, and be content with where God places you, right? Even you know, it's something that's not in your control. What's in, in your control is what you can control. Yeah. And what God can control is, is different than what you can control. And I think it's yeah. interesting to kind of just be content well, in those situations. I, I agree. And uh, I think a lot of times we think of contentment as kind of settling. It's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just be content that I didn't get exactly what I wanted. But actually, to me, contentment, it's like, well, when God gets what he wants, it's a lot better than what you want. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you could be content in the fact that if I get it to what God wants for my life, it's going to be far better than I could have ever imagined for myself. So thank God I'm in the position that I'm in. Thank God that I have this opportunity. It's just, it's his blessing. No question about it. That's really good. Before we let you go, um, it would not make sense for me to have you not be on this show and ask you about compassion. Um, and fill the stadium. We've talked to you multiple times about fill the stadium and compassion and your love for compassion, you and your wife, both kind of doing this ministry together in being involved with compassion. They are partners of ours here at sports spectrum as well. And fill the stadium. We are close. We are almost there. I've been saying it on the show for a couple of weeks now. We're like 75% the way through to filling the stadium, 70,000 kids left in poverty. Um, why is it so important for you to be a part of compassion and all they stand for? And maybe, you know, encourage those that are listening that might be on the fence to want to get involved with compassion to know that like, we're almost there trying to fulfill our goal and why people should get involved. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the goal is arbitrary. You know, it's, it's, we set this number because the size of an NFL stadium, but what's not arbitrary is that there's people that are suffering. Yeah. You know, and I think that uh, we could join God. God's doing the work, but we could join him as his followers. We can join him and be a part of that work and do something really powerful in people's lives. We, we're not allowed to turn a blind eye because um, God saved us out of our most wicked circumstances. So it's our duty, our goal, our responsibility, our joy to be able to do that for others. Um, so I was at a 40 year old um, birthday party. One of my buddies just turned 40 and we're at this birthday party and I couldn't help. I was talking to compassion with everyone there. <laughs> you know what I mm -hmm. mean? It's, it's, it's part of my heart and soul. It's what I enjoy talking about. It's what I want to talk about. And uh, I'm looking forward to having a long standing relationship with them. And I cannot wait to see what God's up to. It's going to be powerful. 
Yeah, he's already done an amazing work. And uh, it's pretty cool when you're a part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, it becomes not about yourself. It becomes about watching, like you just said, about what God can do. Um, I want to give the website out while we're talking here, fillthestadium.com. People can go check it out, fillthestadium.com. And uh, if you feel led to donate, donate. That would be great. But just go pray. You know, look at this situation and the kids that are involved in Compassion's program. And uh, at the very least, we would we would covet your prayers for sure. And if you feel led to be a part of this and and donate, that would be great too. You can check it out at fillthestadium.com. Nate, thanks, buddy. Thanks for uh, hanging out again. And I hope we get to see you in person sometime soon. But either way, uh, it's good to have you back in the league. And uh, yeah. it'll be an interesting year with the Giants. Yeah, it'll be fun. It's going to be interesting. Now it'll be play. fun to watch. It'll be fun to watch. <laughs> all, the, all, all the best to you, my friend. I appreciate it, Jason. Thank you so much. And many thanks to Nate Solder from the New York Giants offensive lineman for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum, the two-time Super Bowl champion when he was with the Patriots. And I just thought that was fantastic. I really did. He is he is going through a lot of things right now, good and bad, ups and downs, and he's working through it. But I loved how he just radiates when he talks about his relationship with Christ and certainly his relationship with his family and his wife Lexi and their three kids, but he radiates when he talks about growing in his relationship with Christ and seeing where God is going to bring them, seeing where God is going to take them. It's just really, I don't know, for me it's encouraging to watch somebody who's in the league now in his 11th season in the NFL uh, in 2021 here. He was drafted in 2011. It's pretty awesome to see Nate Solder just sold out for Jesus. So we wish him nothing but the best. I hope he has a great year. I hope he stays healthy with the New York Giants. So all the best to him, and thanks to him for joining us. Make sure you check out fillthestadium.com as well with our partnership with Compassion International. Fillthestadium.com. You heard Nate talk about it. 70,000 kids needing funding, and we're almost there, 75% of the way through funding our 70,000 goal. But like he said, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. He might take it further and so far beyond anything we could ever imagine in fact, it's not that he might, he will. That's the beauty of our faith in God. He can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever imagine. And I believe he's going to be doing that through this Fill the Stadium initiative with compassion. So check out fillthestadium.com to learn more and to donate and do that today. I promise you, it's a stadium that can't remain empty and it will it will really um, encourage you and enrich your soul as you give to a bigger cause than just something than yourself. You know that this is going to help these children and their families in poverty. Fillthestadium.com. Also check out sportsspectrum.com. And then with this podcast, if you're just joining us for the first time, you've never heard this podcast before, thank you for tuning in. Do us a favor, click subscribe. That way you never miss an episode. New episodes dropping three to four times a week. When you click subscribe, they just come right to your phone. You never miss an episode. So subscribe to the Sports Spectrum podcast and then rate and review and then tell someone about Sports Spectrum. We bring Jesus back into the sports conversation and people like you telling someone else about what we get to do, man, that just means so much to us. And I think if you love sports and you love Jesus, Sports Spectrum is a no brainer. You need to check out what we're doing each and every day over at sportsspectrum.com. And tune in next time. Thanks for joining us here on the show. We love you guys. And have a great rest of your day. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast.